It being 2 p.m., we'll move to questions. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Senator Birmingham. In recent days, China has restricted red meat exports from four of Australia's largest abattoirs and signalled that Australian barley exports may face a tariff of up to 80 per cent. Has the minister yet been able to secure a conversation with his counterpart in China regarding these issues? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. And I thank the senator for his question. Uh, as I've uh, said publicly, we have requested dialogue, and I have requested dialogue and discussions with my counterpart. Uh, we have not uh, secured said meeting as yet. Uh, I would hope that that would be forthcoming. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the government is pursuing all possible avenues in support uh, of assisting our barley producers and our beef producers uh, in relation to maintaining their market access uh, to China. Uh, China has uh, made clear, both publicly and privately, uh, that uh, these are uh, technical matters of trade dispute that uh, date back uh, variously some 12 to 18 months in terms of issues with those uh, particular businesses uh, or sectors. To take Senator Watt's question and, uh, and the interjections there, uh, happy to say in relation to barley that it's an 18-month process, an anti-dumping investigation uh, that has always had a deadline of May the 19th uh, in terms of determination of that. Uh, so why now? Uh, well, if you actually followed the process, you would understand very clearly uh, that it was instigated some time ago. Uh, the deadline that is there is one that has been in place. Uh, we are working with the Australian barley industry to make sure we put uh, a response in to the draft determination that is as compelling as possible, uh, that is based on the economic evidence that Australia's barley producers, like all of our grain growers, uh, are some of the most productive and efficient in the world. Uh, they do not receive uh, trade distorting or market distorting subsidies. They do not dump product below production cost on global markets anywhere in the world. Uh, they simply produce at great volume when the climate allows, uh, at high quality and with efficient prices and competitive prices because of their skill and expertise. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. The Dinmore Meatworks in Ipswich in Queensland is the largest beef processing plant in the Southern Hemisphere. The plant is one of the region's largest employers, with more than 2,000 local workers relying on it for their livelihoods. Can the minister assure the Senate and workers at facilities like Dinmore that the government is dedicated to this issue, the level of attention and resources it demands? Senator Birmingham. <coughs> Mr President, uh, yes, uh, I can assure those workers. So in relation to the four abattoirs who have had their permits to uh, export to China suspended, uh, those suspensions have been as a result, uh, according to Chinese authorities, uh, of irregularities or discrepancies in relation to labelling standards or the like uh, against customs and quarantine matters. Uh, we are now working intensively uh, with those uh, processes uh, to make sure that the evidence is provided back as to how they have rectified uh, any of those discrepancies and how they have put in place effective processes and procedures uh, to make sure that they are not repeated uh, again in the future. Uh, I would note that uh, in 2017, uh, there were around uh, six uh, meatworks uh, that faced a similar uh, process as a result of actions by Chinese authorities. Uh, those issues took some time to rectify, but rectified they were, and we will work as quickly and expeditiously as we can to see these are rectified Order. as well. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, what is the government doing to assist Australian exporters impacted by recent trade restrictions announced by China? and protect the thousands of jobs currently at risk at places like Dinmore Meatworks in Ipswich. Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr President. Obviously, uh, just in relation to uh, our barley industry and those, uh, those four uh, meat processes have outlined the types of steps that we're taking with those sectors to be able to respond to Chinese authorities uh, in a thoughtful way uh, based on the evidence uh, that demonstrates that, as I say, Australia's barley producers uh, operate uh, in the most competitive of ways. Uh, and in no way are subsidised uh, by government uh, to dump product into other markets. In the case of our meat producers, they produce high quality, high value product. Uh, they, of course, need to abide by the customs and quarantine requirements of any market to which they export. 
Uh, and where there have been any discrepancies there, we want to make sure uh, to uphold the standards and reputation of all of Australia's meat industry uh, that they have policies and procedures in place uh, to be able to meet the standards and expectations of the markets to which they export. More generally, as I've told this Senate many times, we continue to open new market access opportunities uh, for many businesses, such as the ones with Order. Indonesia Senator that will come Birmingham. into effect on July 5. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on the impact the coronavirus pandemic has had on Australians and their mental health, and why it's important to ensure support is available to protect the lives and livelihoods of Australians? Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And the Senate will be aware that earlier today the Minister for Health addressed the parliament uh, and gave an update on Australia's response to the COVID-19 situation. As at 6.30 a.m. today, Australia has 6,970 confirmed cases of COVID-19. More than 6,257 of them have fully recovered. 15 people are in intensive care and 13 people are on ventilators. Sadly, there has been a total of 98 deaths from the virus. The rate of increase in new cases has gone from 25 to 30 per cent per day at the peak of growth in cases at the end of March to less than half a per cent a day now. The rate of increase has been below 0.5 per cent for 23 consecutive days. Globally, more than 4 million cases have been confirmed, with more than 290,000 deaths. This puts the threat we face in the clearest context. As the minister has stated, we need to be clear our work is not finished and the virus is not defeated. There is still a long way to go and uh, we have a long road to travel to protect our national health. Last week we saw a very powerful piece of work from Pat McGorry and Ian Hickey in the University of Sydney, highlighting the extent to which Australians' mental health is at risk in a major economic downturn. We know that supporting Australians to get back to work is critical for both their economic security and their aspirations, but also to help with their mental health. These factors are intrinsically linked. This is a deeply human reminder of the importance of assisting people to get back to work. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. What additional measures has the Morrison government put in place to support Australians with their mental health during this difficult time? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the government's $74 million mental health support package will make sure that Australians have access to the right services and the right support wherever they are around the country. The expanded telehealth program is playing a critical role in providing mental health care and support during the pandemic. About half of all mental health Medicare subsidised services are currently provided by telehealth, as well as a significant proportion of general consultations under the $669 million program. We have implemented a new, free of charge, 24-7 Beyond Blue support service, which is available via phone or online. We have also established a dedicated program for our heroic frontline health workers led by the Black Dog Institute, to keep this essential workforce well. Supporting the mental health of Australians during this pandemic is a priority of Order. the Morrison Senator government. Cash. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How do these measures build upon the government's previous investment to protect Australians' mental and physical health? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And uh, the Minister for Health today announced the new position of Deputy Chief Officer, Medical Officer for Mental Health. Leading psychiatrist Dr Ruth Vine has been appointed, and we extend our congratulations to her, as a Deputy Chief Medical Officer with expertise in mental health. Just as the government is modelling the spread of COVID-19 infection to continue flattening the curve, we are also closely monitoring mental health service usage so that we can respond quickly and thus lessen the mental health impacts of the pandemic and the recovery phase. As a next step, a national mental health pandemic response plan will this week be discussed with states and territories 
through the National Cabinet. The plan has been prepared with the support of the National Mental Health Commission in consultation with states and territories and key stakeholders. Again, the mental health and wellbeing of Australians Order, is a Senator priority. Cash. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Darcy Moran from Victoria has been a hospitality worker for 15 years and has never been unemployed during that time. Yet, like 46 per cent of casuals in that sector, Darcy has been with his current employer for less than 12 months, making him ineligible for a job keeper. Does the minister think it is fair to exclude Darcy and workers like him from the program? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. What we think would be fair to Darcy uh, is uh, if uh, the state government in Victoria started easing restrictions uh, so that businesses in Victoria, so that businesses in Victoria could, employ, uh, could employ people like Darcy, could give people like Darcy Order. a job. That is, that is what we think would be fair. That is what we, that is what we think would be fair. And that is, that is point number one. That is, that is point number one. You've asked me it would be fair. We, we want to see businesses around Australia to start getting back into business so they can hire more Australians again, including, including people like Darcy. Now, uh, in, relation, in relation to the JobKeeper program, which uh, provides support then to more than 5.5 million working Australians, more than 5.5 million working Australians. Uh, the eligibility Order. criteria are very clear. My the left. program is designed to keep uh, employees connected to the employer where that is possible, uh, to keep connected, to keep uh, employees connected. Uh, and uh, in relation to casuals, that means, that means, that means, in relation to casuals, that relates to long-term casuals, where there is an established relationship with the employer, and in fact, it is based on the definition in the Fair Work Act. Uh, it is the Fair Work Act that, des that describes uh, a long-term casual as somebody who has been with the same employer for uh, 12 months, for at least 12 months, and that is, of course, uh, what we are using. And, and it is, of course, not uh, right to say that there is no support available uh, to Darcy. I don't, un I don't know. Uh, the specific circumstances, but you know, for those who find themselves uh, unfortunately out of a job in the current circumstances, the appropriate job seeker uh, support arrangements are in place, supplemented by the COVID supplement, which effectively doubles the job uh, seeker uh, job seeker payment, and, and, and that is that is of course uh, the appropriate way the appropriate way for us to provide an enhanced social safety net in the circumstances. But it is it is it is of course now time. order, Senator Cormann, um, Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Thank you. ABS figures released last week show that hospitality has been one of the hardest hit sectors in this crisis, with more than a third of jobs lost. With 78 per cent of hospitality workers casual, does the minister agree that the workers who are hardest hit by this crisis have the least access to JobKeeper? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I certainly agree that the hospitality sector is one of the sectors that has been hardest hit, and it's also a sector that can uh, recover very quickly once the uh, restrictions are eased. And uh, indeed, it is, there is an opportunity now for restrictions to be eased, for uh, the hospitality sector to start increasing its activity again, uh, so that they so that they can start. Uh, employing more Australians, and, and you know we think that that is that is something that we would like to see happen. Certainly, over the phased fi appropriately over the next uh, few weeks and months, and all of these announcements have been Order. made. Now, now, and the truth, of course, is that there are appropriate supports in place for workers in that circumstance who have lost their job. The job seeker uh, payments have been effectively doubled uh, through the COVID uh, supplement, which is in place uh, for uh, the uh, six months period. Senator Walsh, final supplementary question. Thank you. Up to a million workers who contribute to industries like hospitality, health, education and caregiving will miss out on JobKeeper, lose their job and their connection to their workplace. These workers have been there for Australians, including during this crisis. Why is the government not there for them now? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, you know, every job seeker who is unable to find a job, as, you know, as long as you know, and we've, of course, eased all of the um, eligibility. We've wiped waiting periods. We've, uh, um, we've uh, wiped various uh, tests. 
uh, that are required uh, to be made. And, and you know, we've also made adjustments to the carnal income and the like. Uh, so we've made it easier for people to access uh, job seeker if they're out of work. We've uh, doubled, effectively doubled, uh, the job seeker uh, payment uh, to help Australians who've lost their job through this period. Uh, in relation to JobKeeper, as I've indicated, and I think we've gone around and around uh, this issue for some time now, but this is about keeping uh, workers with an established connection uh, to an employer connected uh, to their employer, uh, and, uh, and indeed that is, uh, that is what this program is there for, and as far as casuals are concerned, and we have included uh, casuals, but we have uh, included long-term casuals uh, who have worked for the same employer for more than 12 months. That is an appropriate uh, test. It's a test that is uh, reflected in the Fair Work Act uh, Order, already, Senator and that is of course why we rely on The answer has expired. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Last week, the Treasurer announced a six-month delay for legislation associated with the 76 recommendations from the Hain Banking Royal Commission. These recommendations would underpin the biggest sector reform to financial services and our financial system in decades many of which will be crucial to Australians in the difficult economic times ahead. The sector has had over 15 months to prepare for this reform, but still have recently been on public record calling for legislative delays due to this pandemic. Minister, why have you succumbed to lobbying pressure from the big banks and delayed this much-needed critical reform? And what's to stop big business putting up other reasons in the future that this is not a convenient time for them for legislative reform. The Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Um, th th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I don't think that any reasonable Australian would uh, argue with the proposition that, given the circumstances, given the extent of the crisis, given uh, the need to ensure that our banks and our financial system uh, can focus 100% uh, on supporting our economy through this period, uh, that the decisions that were made by the Treasurer to defer uh, the implementation of uh, relevant measures uh, is appropriate. I don't think that anyone would disagree. Anyone, I don't think anyone reasonable uh, would disagree uh, with the uh, proposition that in the circumstances it is entirely appropriate for this deferral to have occurred uh, and, and, of course, at the right time we will revisit those reforms. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. Minister, has the government simply considered legislating this reform now with extensions to effective start dates, which is common for a lot of legislation in this place, or are you working directly with the big banks on writing this legislation? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, legislation is developed uh, in uh, the usual way, uh, subject to proper consultation with all relevant stakeholders. Senator Wish Wilson, a final supplementary question. Minister, all political parties agreed to legislate the full suite of Hain recommendations on the day they were released, which makes this Royal Commission unique. And I'll stress again, that was 15 months ago. Given the legislation is non-controversial, why won't you recall Parliament and support the Greens' motion to do so in the coming weeks so we can do our job and pass this critical reform now? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Right now, what the Australian people want us to do is uh, to ensure uh, that we uh, keep them safe from uh, a renewed, from a second wave of the coronavirus, and uh, then I want to ensure that we continue to support them through this transition, this difficult economic transition, and that we maximise uh, the opportunities for all Australians for a strong, to benefit from a strong economic recovery on the other side. And that is, of course, precisely what we're focusing on. Uh, and at the next election, uh, you will be able to deliver your report card on our performance as a government. We'll be putting forward our report. report, report report card and our plans for the future, and the Australian people will make a decision on whether they prefer your approach or our approach. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, can the minister update the Senate on the effects of the coronavirus pandemic on the Pacific and on how Australia is providing support to our neighbours in their health responses? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Fawcett uh, very much for his question. Uh, very swift action taken by our Pacific neighbours to restrict travel and quarantine measures uh, has uh, very effectively kept COVID-19 infection rates in the Pacific to a very low rate. Uh, but that is not to say that we can be complacent. In fact, we must absolutely continue to be vigilant. 
Australia has pivoted our development partnerships to help Pacific Island countries and Timor-Leste to protect communities from COVID-19. Uh, we've indeed responded to over 80 requests from the region since January, uh, including uh, for a range of issues, PPE, medical supplies, uh, quarantine management, uh, laboratories, pandemic communications and outreach, isolation facilities and emergency response services. We're working with the WHO, the Pacific Community, New Zealand and the United States uh, to procure and distribute gene expert diagnostic equipment to improve COVID-19 testing. This enables COVID-19 test results to be available uh, and delivered in less than an hour, which is essential if countries are to respond quickly to any outbreaks. Uh, testing equipment has already arrived in the Cook Islands, in Fiji, in Kiribati, in PNG, in Nauru, in Niue, in Samoa, in the Solomons, in Tonga, in Tokelau and in Tuvalu, with deliveries expected to other countries in coming days and weeks. Uh, we are very grateful for uh, the support we've received from uh, airlines and the ADF uh, for the delivery of uh, a number of those. Our Pacific Step Up initiatives are also pivoting to respond to the needs of our neighbours. Our Pacific Women's Partnership, supporting crisis centres uh, to provide remote counselling and frontline service support. In Timor-Leste, working to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in women's shelters. Our Pacific Fusion Centre is focused on producing targeted and timely information on COVID-19 to support key decision makers. Our focus is on absolutely supporting our Pacific partners to address the pandemic. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, can you advise the Senator on what Australia is doing in the Pacific region to help with the movement of people and essential supplies? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Fawcett. This is a really important question because Australia has a vital role uh, as a transport hub between the Pacific uh, and usually the world. But at the moment, it's very focused uh, with our Pacific counterparts and, I, and, and, and Australia agreeing to establish a pathway uh, for humanitarian, technical and medical supplies. This humanitarian corridor is absolutely central to, develop, to delivering life-saving supplies uh, in response also to Tropical Cyclone Harold, uh, which has of course compounded the impact of COVID-19 in the Solomon Islands, in Tonga, in Vanuatu and in Fiji. So we are standing with our Pacific partners as they also move to repair the damage caused by TC Harold. We have ensured our diplomats, the Australian Federal Police, defence personnel and humanitarian workers have been able to remain in place to support the delivery of key services. And the corridor is also facilitating the return of Pacific Island and Timorese nationals to their home countries, including Order. from places Senator as far afield as West the Africa. Answer has expired. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, could you outline to the Senate uh, what Australia is doing to partner with our neighbours to help our region recover economically from the COVID-19 crisis. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, we are looking beyond the immediate health security and safety impacts of COVID-19. We're engaging on economic support with PNG, with Fiji, with the Solomons, uh, with Samoa and Tonga, with Nauru, Kiribati, Vanuatu, Tuvalu and Timor-Leste. Their small island economies are heavily dependent on tourism uh, and commodity exports. They're particularly vulnerable to the economic impact of COVID-19. The Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific will promote economic recovery uh, when that point in time is reached by delivering infrastructure focused on jobs and growth and including health infrastructure. We also have new visa, me visa measures in place to enable workers in Australia under the Pacific Labor Scheme and the Seasonal Worker Program who are unable to return home to stay here for up to 12 months. They'll be able to support themselves and their families at home, which is pivotal in times of economic difficulty, while also supporting key businesses and industries here in Australia. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Can the Minister confirm that Donata employees performing identical work as Australians at other firms and contributing as taxpayers face unemployment because the government has deliberately excluded them from the JobKeeper wage subsidy? Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, the company that uh, Senator Sheldon references uh, is uh, a subsidiary, a wholly owned subsidiary of a foreign government owned business uh, and a foreign government owned business which just recently released 
uh, results showing that they are into their 32nd consecutive year of profitability. 32nd year of uh, consecutive year of uh, profitability. So I can confirm that the rules that apply to JobKeeper do not provide uh, JobKeeper payments to uh, Australian local government owned businesses, uh, do not provide JobKeeper payments uh, to any government owned business in Australia and not to foreign government owned businesses in Australia. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Well, referring to the exclusion from JobKeeper of 5,500 Donata employees, Liberal MP Craig Kelly has said, and I quote, these airport workers should be included, and these workers were all previous Qantas employees. Can the minister confirm these workers would have been eligible for JobKeeper simply if they were employed by Qantas? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much. Well, if I, uh, if I work or um, is employed by an Australian business that is a wholly owned Australian business in Australia, uh, which, uh, which is eligible Order. and is otherwise eligible because of other uh, requirements being met in relation to turnover variations and the like, uh, then of course uh, workers in that business through their business would be able to receive JobKeeper payments. But workers uh, that are working for a government effectively, for a foreign government owned business, are not eligible under our rules. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. So why won't the Morrison government step up to help workers at firms like Donata and preserve thousands of jobs and livelihoods as if it has for millions of Australians workers to date? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I, I don't think that anyone can credibly argue that we're not stepping up to support Australian workers. I mean, we're providing massive support, Order. massive support, massive support to Australian workers. Five, more than 5.5 million uh, Australians uh, receiving, are being supported by JobKeeper payments. And of course, we have uh, effectively doubled the JobSeeker payments, a significant increase in the number of Australians now receiving JobSeeker payments. We have provided a substantially enhanced uh, social safety net, as well as, of course, providing support to businesses to stay connected to their uh, longer-term employees. And that is, that, is, uh, that is what we've done. The rules are very clear. Uh, you do have to draw the line somewhere. And uh, we, it is true to say that foreign government-owned uh, businesses uh, in Australia are not eligible for JobKeeper. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. As Australia responds to the coronavirus pandemic, can the Minister outline to the Senate what actions the Morrison government has taken to support businesses and workers in defence industry through these challenging times? Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Henderson for her question and also for her tireless support for defence industry in a home state and across the nation. The Morrison government remains resolutely committed to delivering ADF capability and also to backing in Australian defence industry throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Our actions are focused in three main areas. Firstly, supporting our sovereign industrial capability. Secondly, supporting our nation's essential skills, trades and expertise, and also supporting our domestic and international supply chains. To ensure we respond quickly to emerging is issues in defence industry, Minister Price and I hold weekly teleconferences with defence, defence industry CEOs, peak industry bodies and also state and territory advocates. And because of our swift action to support defence industry, since the 23rd of March, over $4.7 billion of payments have been made early to defence industry here in Australia. Uh, with that payment, I conveyed very strongly my expectations to Primes that those early payments must be passed on to small and medium enterprises, and I'm delighted that that is exactly what they are doing. This action is supporting over 15,000 Australian companies in the defence uh, supply chain and most importantly, it is supporting 70,000 Australian livelihoods during this time. Its vital defence industry activities are also continuing during COVID-19. For example, Kemmering Australia, based near Geelong, secured a US contract to produce countermeasure flares for global F-35 Joint Strike Fighter fleet. The rollout of the first Royal Wingman aircraft occurred. We commissioned the build of six new Cape class vessels in Western Australia, and we've also shifted Land 400 Phase 3 roadshows 
online to ensure Australian Order. businesses Senator have the Reynolds, opportunity to pitch the their capabilities. Expired. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Can the minister outline what actions Defence has taken to provide economic stimulus? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Henderson. And yes, I can. This government's $200 billion investment in new defence capability is now more important than ever. We must ensure that both our ADF and our defence industry here in Australia remain strong. This government's investment in Australia's defence industry will play an increasingly important part in our nation's economic recovery. In addition to paying out early over $4.7 billion to defence industry, we have implemented a number of other measures to assist the defence industry and also to help stimulate our nation's economy. These include increasing and accelerating $850 million in estate and infrastructure expenditure right across our nation and supporting defence innovation, skilling and sovereign industrial development through our grants programs. We are continuing to proactively identify new opportunities to ensure that defence industry weathers the COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Henderson, final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline how the government is continuing to deliver defence capability so our men and women in uniform can continue to defend Australia and its national interests? Senator Reynolds. Mm. Uh, thanks, Senator Henderson, for that question. And can I be very clear to all those in this chamber? COVID-19 will not affect funding for the government's $200 billion investment in defence capability, nor will it prevent defence expenditure reaching 2 per cent of GDP next financial year, which was three years earlier than we promised in 2013. I'm working with defence to ensure we adapt to the current environment and continue to find innovative ways of doing business during this time. And let me remind all of you in this chamber that in our six years of government, we have commissioned the Australian build of 63 naval vessels, including 12 attack class submarines, and this is backed up with real funding. Under our plan, we have already delivered six naval vessels, with another nine under construction in both Perth and in Adelaide. This investment is ensuring our ADF personnel are provided with the Order. capability Reynolds, they need to keep the them safe. The answer has expired. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The Morrison government has said it will fast track Australia's environment law changes before the independent review currently underway into the EPBC no. Act is even complete. Isn't it true that the government is using the COVID-19 health crisis as an excuse to greenlight new projects for your mining and development mates and that you're undermining the integrity of the independent review and the work of the independent panel? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, what is true is that we're going to focus on growing the economy uh, more strongly again on the other side of this uh, COVID-induced crisis, and all Australians would expect us to do precisely that. Uh, it, it has become way too difficult and way too expensive to get projects off the ground in Australia, and, uh, and as a country we need to reflect on that. We need to ensure that there is an appropriate balance between uh, effective environmental protection uh, and the pursuit of economic opportunity, and that is precisely what our government is doing. Uh, we, we want to see our economy grow more strongly. We want to see more projects getting up. We want to uh, see more projects getting up, which will then be able to uh, hire more Australians and give them and their families opportunities to get ahead. That is what we want to see, and we will do so in a way that, of course, will continue to uh, maintain uh, an appropriate focus and, and keep regard of all of the environmental protection requirements uh, that, uh, that we, of course, support. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. I have a supplementary question to the minister. The sectors hardest hit by COVID-19 are indeed tourism, hospitality, arts and entertainment, making up 60 per cent of the job losses so far. Yet the government has stacked their COVID commission full of mining executives and developers who are hell-bent on cutting green tape and in the interests of the economy. Your government's more in interested in your mates in the mining industry than they are creating Australian jobs. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I couldn't really see the question mark at the end of that. Uh, I take that as a comment uh, or as a, as, a, as a little speech. But let me just, just for the avoidance of any doubt, let me just say that I completely uh, reject the premise of that non-question. 
Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I've got a, a third question for the minister. The government's appointed this COVID commission. It says that the minister, that the today we found out in the committee, the COVID committee, that the interests of the members of this commission. Uh, it is up to them personally to disclose their interests as to whether the projects they advocate are benefiting them personally. What is the government going to do to commit to ensure their mates aren't feathering their own nest, instead doing Order, what Australia Senator needs? Senator Hanson-Young, um, as much of the question as you heard, um, Senator Cormann. Well, I mean, I, my, my question back in response to that uh, question. You no, know, I was given a statement before instead of a question, so I'm going to give a question back in response to a question. <laughs> How do you declare your interest, if not by your? I mean, who, who declares your interests on your behalf? Who, who declares your interests on your behalf? Like, I mean, who else other than yourself can declare your own interest? I mean, that is a genuine question. Like, I'm, I'm, somewhat, I'm somewhat intrigued. Let me just say that the people that are serving on the national uh, COVID Coordination Commission are distinguished Australians, distinguished Australians who are providing great service to our country at a very difficult time. We're very grateful for the service that they're providing. Very, very grateful. And it is a, it is a, it is a broad cross-section. I would not, I would, I do not agree with the characterisation that Senator Hanson Young uh, has uh, put on them in a sort of a one swipe uh, and sort of sweeping statement. Let me just say uh, that there is, uh, I mean. Let me just say we support their work and we absolutely we have great Senator confidence Cormann, that they will time for make the, the appropriate has declarations. Expired. I remind senators to phrase their questions in accordance with Standing Order 73, which is quite strict on material that shall not be contained in questions. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is also to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. When the $2 billion National Bushfire Recovery Fund was announced in January, Prime Minister Scott Morrison claimed the funds would, and I quote, be ready to hit the ground in communities where the fire front has passed to help them rebuild. Can the minister confirm that figures released earlier this week have revealed the government has paid out less than $260 million, or less than one in eight dollars promised, from its $2 billion fund months after the fires hit? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President, uh, and uh, sadly uh, it is my melancholy duty to inform the Chamber that unfortunately the Opposition uh, got it simply wrong again. Uh, we're talking here about a $2 billion bushfire recovery program, which was of course always designed to run over two years. That was always, that was always, uh, that was always the plan, two, over two calendar years. And by the end of this financial year, this is by the end of June 2020, uh, it, about $900 million will have, uh, will have, will have been expensed. Oh, sorry, Senator Watt, on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. Point of order relevance. My question was about the spending that has occurred, not what might occur one day in the future. Um, I, I will continue to listen carefully to the minister's answer. I believe, with respect, he was directly addressing the subject matter of the question. Let, let me take Senator Watt through the detail. So, $500 million uh, will uh, be um, will be paid out, or is being paid out. Is, is being paid out this financial year on the following. Over $170 million. Order. Senator, Senator um, Cormann, I've got Senator Wong on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. The, the point of order is direct relevance. The question is not about the future. The question was very specific to figures released earlier this week, which revealed expenditure to date. It is, and would the minister simply been asked to confirm that? He hasn't been asked about future expenditure. He's been asked to very clear question about what has been spent and figures which have been released this week. On the point of order, Senator Cormann. On the point of order, and uh, you know, it, as much as I hesitate to correct um, Senator Wong, the data that uh, Senator Watt is referring to is quite uh, outdated. It's uh, March data, and uh, and so from, that is why I'm providing that is why I'm providing in a directly relevant fashion more up to date information. I had Senator Watt. Do you want Senator Wong? Uh, well, Mr. President, if he wishes to do that, that would be directly relevant. But he's actually saying what will be spent. Um, I will consider whether the nature of directly relevant has a temporal element to it. Um, but with all, with all due respect, there was a quotation from Senator Watt about the program. I believe the minister is being directly relevant to the subject matter because the um, minister 
can be directly relevant to all or part of a question. I've allowed you to restate the point at the end of the question, but I believe the minister is being directly relevant by going into detail about the program that is referred to in the quotation contained at the beginning of the question. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, you know, Labor, of course, as always, have got this wrong. A $2 billion two-year program, and in the first six months, in the first six months, we will have uh, spent nearly, will have spent nearly half, nearly half. Now, of course, this is a uh, evolving. This is a program that is implemented on an evolving basis. Uh, we, on an evolving basis, over 170 million has been allocated to 10,000 small business uh, support grants. Over 100 million in expanded primary uh, producers grants, over $32 million in back-to-school support payments, over $60 million in payments to impacted local government areas, over $27 million in mental health support to school communities and emergency service workers, over $50 million in emergency relief and financial counselling, over $26 million for wildlife and habitat recovery, and uh, also by the end of June, $400 million will be paid out of the fund uh, to reimburse states for cleanup costs. And of course, the timing of these payments, and that is something else that Senator Watt doesn't understand, the timing of these payments actually depends on when the invoices come in, Mr. President. I know that, I know that the Labour Party wants to just throw the money out the with, without the invoices having come in, but we are order. actually paying Senator Watt on, on, a, on, on a point of order. Senator Watt, I have Senator Watt on a point of order. On, Senator Wong. Again, again on relevance, is the minister suggesting that people living in tents should be sending invoices? Senator Watt, that's um, not a point of order. Senator Cormann, um, have you concluded your answer? You have. Senator Watt, do you have a supplementary question? I do, Mr President. Can the minister confirm that some of the government's most hyped bushfire funding pledges, including mental health assistance for schools and rural financial counselling, are yet to receive a single dollar? They are not outdated figures. They are figures that were provided in a question on notice answered on Monday this week. Senator Cormann. Th th thank you very much, Mr President. And as Senator Watt well knows, is that answers, uh, questions, answers to questions on notice from estimates go to the period of the time when the question is asked. So they are outdated figures. But I will, I will, I will provide, in an abundance of openness and transparency, and to make sure that I've got the most up-to-date current information, I will ensure that I provide Senator Watt with an updated uh, answer to the question on notice. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Australians on the ground in bushfire-affected areas know that money is not reaching those who need it. With winter approaching, bushfire victims are still living with friends in caravans, in temporary accommodation, while the government tries to spin what it's actually doing. These people need action, not more marketing. When will the Morrison government actually deliver the money they promised so that bushfire-hit communities can actually rebuild? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Well, let me just say it very clearly. I mean, these days our communities have gone through a terrible crisis, and, and they are getting significant support from government, state and federal, and we are working as fast as we can in you know, what are, quite frankly, pretty complex circumstances, uh, not made easier by uh, the uh, health crisis that we've also had to deal with very hard on the back of the uh, bushfire crisis. So you know, I, I can see that uh, Senator Watt is uh, you know, intent on pursuing political points here, but let me tell you that communities actually do know, communities, communities do know, communities do know that we are doing our absolute best to provide support to them as soon as we can in what is a very difficult circumstance. Order. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Man Management, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister outline how Australia's agricultural sector and other critical rural and regional sectors such as resources are supporting economic growth during these difficult economic times? resulting from the coronavirus pandemic. Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And can I thank Senator Canavan for his question and acknowledge the extraordinary um, contribution he's made in, uh, in demonstrating the, the incredible economic support and contribution that these two sectors make to the Australian economy and noting that these two sectors that he refers to are in rural and regional Australia. Um, but now more than ever, um, is it absolutely important that our resources and our agricultural sectors um, are part of the road to recovery uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic? Because despite the challenges that we have been seeing 
um, over the last couple of months, uh, it is very pleasing to be able to report that Australia has achieved uh, once again record trade surpluses of $10.6 billion. That means that we have now had 27 consecutive months of trade surpluses and acknowledge the extraordinary work of Senator Birmingham as the Trade Minister and his predecessors in making sure that our trade continues to support our Australian economy even through these really tough times. And we understand as a government the importance of our international markets and market access uh, to make sure that we support our agricultural producers and other exporters. Um, hugely important to areas uh, agriculture, fisheries and our forestry sectors, which do continue to remain strong uh, despite the crises that we have been confronting, not just the coronavirus but the drought that has been part of the Australian landscape for so long. Um, this has been largely achieved through the amazing efforts of the free trade agreements that have been put in place, because they do provide extraordinary benefits to agriculture, fisheries, forestry. They provide new market opportunities uh, by reducing tariffs and making sure that our price competitiveness and our efficiency and, and, and innovation uh, levels the playing field for Australian producers in the international marketplace. And only last week we saw the Indo uh, Indonesia complete its ratification process for our closer economic partnership Order, agreement with Senator that country. Rushton. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, uh, I do have a supplementary. Minister, how is the Liberal National Government supporting further investment in agriculture to help grow Australia's exports further? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, well, Senator Canavan, the government continues to support our agriculture and resource sectors uh, through increased investment. Uh, Investment in excess of $1.5 billion through programs at the National Water Infrastructure Development Fund and the National Water Infrastructure Loan Facility, which is funding 22 new water infrastructure projects across Australia. Because more water means more produce, more produce that Australia can export so that we can make sure that we continue to have the, uh, the income for Australia so to maintain our standard of living. Um, Investments in things like the Rookwood Weir, $176 million up in your area in the Fitzroy Basin, $242 million to the Dungowan Dam and $325 million to build Wyangala Dam in New South Wales. $100 million to further modernise the Tasmanian irrigation system. We will continue to support these irrigation projects because they are the backbone of Australia's agricultural sector. Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister explain how important timely approval processes are to encouraging future investments in sectors like agriculture and resources, and what measures the government is implementing to help improve approval times? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Um, it is absolutely essential that Australia remains at the forefront of an efficient agricultural um, producer. Um, we obviously face unprecedented times at the moment by changing global market conditions, international competition, new technologies, climate and water risks and global disruptions such as the pandemic that we are currently facing. So delays in environmental approval processes are add millions of dollars to the cost of major projects, and that is why this government is absolutely focused on busting the congestion to break through these multi-million dollar backlogs of environmental assessments to make sure that we continue to de deliver these projects, recognising that it's very important that we continue to make sure that our environmental protections are in place, but do not delay projects to make sure that we continue to support our economy with these in, uh, very important projects. And I can advise that we have improved that process from 19 per cent in December to 87 per cent in March, and we are on target to 100 per cent approval Senator Rustin, by June Senator 2020. Farrell. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. <coughs> The Australian National Audit Office has revealed the Prime Minister, that Mo uh, Prime Minister Morrison's office forced uh, former Minister Mackenzie to seek his authority on the approved projects under the Community Sports Infrastructure Grant Program and to inform the Prime Minister of the rollout plan. What authority was the Prime Minister exercising? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I don't, I don't accept the characterisation that what Senator Farrell has put on it. I don't accept the characterisation Senator Farrell has put on it. What I would say is this: I have consistently made clear that the o order, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Uh, the point of order is direct relevance. Senator Mackenzie just interjected and said it was authority to announce. If that is the government's position, could the Prime order. Minister's representative um, indicate order. that? Order, Senator Wong. That 
With, with respect, leaders get some latitude. The, the point is, the minister has been speaking for 12 seconds. I'm not in a position to rule on direct relevance at this point, uh, and that wasn't technically a point of order, Senator Wong. Senator Cormann. And, and that point of order quite inappropriately creates the impression that I haven't previously addressed this. I would refer Senator Wong to the Hansard. I've consistently made the point that the decision maker in relation to the project was the uh, then uh, Minister for Sports, Senator, Senator McKenzie. And, but that it is, of order. course. Order. Order. I Order. I can't hear the minister's answer. Senator Cormann. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. As I've said on a number of occasions in the past, in relation to announcement arrangements, of course, uh, Senator McKenzie uh, liaised with the uh, Prime Minister's office as appropriate, and uh, approval was sought uh, for uh, announcement arrangements. I mean, that is something that has been made clear consistently. That is something that I've made clear in this chamber as the Prime Minister's representative before. Nothing that, I mean, leaving the, the rhetorical flourish uh, to one side, nothing that uh, Senator Farrell has just said is actually in any way inconsistent. Uh, with with, uh, with what I've previously said to the Senate and indeed what the Prime Minister has previously said publicly. In fact, I refer you to what he said on ABC television on the 28th of February 2020, when he said, and I'm quoting the Prime Minister now, what she sought from me was approval to make announcements. So, she, so I mean, she'd made the decision. She'd authorised the decisions on the 4th of April, and it's commonplace for ministers, before they make announcements about projects, that they seek approval from the Prime Minister. And that is precisely what happened. That is a consistent, that is a consistent uh, answers that we've given to these questions. And Senator Wong uh, inappropriately trying to create the impression that somehow this is a new revelation, I completely reject. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the ANAO uh, further confirmed, and I quote, February advice from the Prime Minister's office to the Minister's office was that the Prime Minister had not had a chance to look at the list. Why did the former uh, minister's office have to wait for the prime minister to look at the list? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. It's very simple. It goes to announcement arrangements. Uh, the decisions were made by the minister, who was responsible, and who, incidentally, I mean, this is, of course, a very popular, very successful program. And as a result of Senator McKenzie exercising appropriately her ministerial discretion, she increased the proportion of funding going to Labor held electorates. I mean, that is a very important point, because in this constant smear that Labor is seeking to perpetuate here uh, against the hard working, uh, distinguished, outstanding member of our team, this persistent smear that you're trying to spread here, you always, you always hide the fact that the uh, minister's discretion actually increased the proportion of uh, funding going into uh, Labour-held electorates, uh, contrary to the decisions that were made at the public service level. So Minister McKenzie ensured that there was a fairer, more appropriate distribution of those funds in what is an outstanding and very successful project. And none amount of smear and innuendo from the Labour Party uh, will uh, get, uh, get anyone away from that fact. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Uh, yes, I do have one. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. How many times did the Prime Minister review these infamous colour-coded spreadsheets? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I, I don't believe that uh, the Prime Minister had any involvement with uh, spreadsheets of the nature that you describe. Uh, the Prime Minister, as he has made clear, as uh, Senator McKenzie has made clear, as I've made clear, on a number of occasions now, appropriately, was involved in decision making around announcement arrangements. The uh, projects uh, had been approved by the responsible minister at the time, appropriately, consistent with the ministerial guidelines that had been issued at the time, uh, and uh, announcement arrangements are the same in our government as they would have been in your government. The same in our government as they would have been in your government. And this sort of confected outrage is starting to wear a bit thin, particularly given people are focused on some significantly more important issues right now. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, speaking of important issues, my Order. question is to Senator the minister Chandler. representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is boosting services to support the livelihoods of Australians who have been impacted by the coronavirus pandemic? Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Chandler, for your question and the opportunity uh, to tell the Chamber what the government has been doing um, as we face the, an unprecedented demand and significant new challenges uh, that have been presented by the coronavirus, uh, particularly to Services Australia, who are at the forefront of supporting Australians who have been impacted by this pandemic. Throughout this time, Services Australia have been required to deliver new and improved income support measures 
and fast track the Australian government's coronavirus financial support to many, many thousands of Australians in need. We acknowledge that this has been a particularly difficult time for many Australians, and can I acknowledge the extraordinary patience and understanding that they have shown as we have had to ramp up the services at Services Australia to a level that we have never, ever seen before. This effort includes the redeployment of over 12,000 additional staff into uh, support centres, call centres and processing claims. Um, since the 27th of July, we've got the 550 coronavirus supplement out the door, uh, valuing uh, $1.1 billion for that fortnight to around 1.9 million Australians. Can I also say that we've ramped up the cap capability uh, and the stability of our online service systems, particularly MyGov, and we've seen a capacity uh, increase from 6,000 concurrent users to 300,000 concurrent users just in a matter of days. Uh, in the month of April, um, we had an average of 1.7 million Australians that were on MyGov every single day, and on one day alone we had three, 3 million Australians, which is the most amount that we've ever seen on the MyGov website. We've also managed to get the $750 stimulus payment out in early April uh, to over 6.8 million Australians, uh, $5.1 billion in the hands of Australians who most need it. This is an injection into the Australian economy to support Australians through this corona pandemic. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the Minister for her response. What improvements has the government made to ensure Australians have timely access to the support they need? Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the government has made ex extraordinary and significant changes to the Services Australia delivery mechanism, including making sure that process is simplified, that we've moved to digital processing so Australians can get their payments in a timely way, but also from the safety of their own homes. From the 25th of March 2020, Australians were able to register their intent to make a claim, a claim by logging onto their MyGov account which means that they could register for financial support in a matter of just minutes. We appreciate the patience of the Australian community that, have, uh, that they have shown as we have put these, pre these systems into place. Um, Services Australia have also introduced a streamlined job seeker process um, uh, claim form to allow people to claim, make their claims in 20 questions. This has halved the amount of average time for somebody who is making a typical job seeker claim. We are absolutely committed to supporting Australians who have needed our support through Services Australia through these unprecedented Senator times. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate what has been the result of these enhancements? Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr President. Since 16 March 2020, Services Australia have processed more than one million job seeker claims. That's more than double the number of claims that we would process last year. So in the space of six weeks, we've done an equivalent of two years' normal work. This is in addition to the millions of Australians who have accessed our services for health, welfare, child support payments and other services that Services Australia provide to everyday Australians. We've also been able to extend the job seeker phone line hours from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, on workdays. And can I once again extend my thanks to the Australian public for their extraordinary patience as they've had to interact with these new systems as we've got them up and running in the most extraordinary speed. Um, can I also, though, thank uh, and acknowledge the extraordinary work of the staff at Services Australia, the frontline staff who have had to deal with people who are in very, very distressing circumstances, and thank them for the passion and dedication that, that they have exhibited as they have dealt with Australians who are in extraordinary vulnerable times. Senator Ayres. Uh, thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Uh, Labor acknowledges the awful situation that has confronted residents, families and staff at Newmarch House in Sydney's west, and uh, we do want to express our deeper sympathies to all those who have lost loved ones. Does the minister agree that the residents in that centre, their loved ones and the staff at Newmarch House deserve a thorough and independent review of what has gone wrong? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And, uh, can I add uh, my thoughts and condolences, and I'm sure everybody in the chamber's thoughts and condolences, to the families of uh, residents in all aged care facilities, in fact all of those who have lost loved ones uh, to, the, to coronavirus. It's uh, had a particularly devastating impact. 
uh, at Newmarch, uh, and I've already asked my department to provide me at an appropriate time with a report uh, of uh, what has occurred there, just as I did with Dorothy Henderson Lodge, and my understanding is that that report was considered by National Cabinet a week or so ago. So it is important that people understand properly what's, what has occurred uh, within these facilities. It is and has been extremely difficult for the families and for the residents, and uh, we've seen only uh, too graphically publicly the concern that they've expressed when they haven't had appropriate levels of communication and information as to what's happening with their loved ones within the facilities. I am very pleased to say that. Uh, particularly that the interventions of the government and the resources provided by the government uh, has considerably assisted in that respect. Uh, three interventions now by the Quality and Safety Commissioner uh, in respect of assistance with senior management capacity within the facility, uh, a communications uh, instruction to uh, Anglicare via Newmarch to provide much better information out to families, which I know uh, from talking to them is, is giving them much more comfort with respect to the circumstance of their loved ones, and of course the intervention last week uh, with a, uh, an instruction to comply that was issued by the Quality and Safety Commissioner. Uh, I think we all want to understand the lessons from what's occurred at Newmarch. Uh, we continue to work very closely with all of the health authorities that are involved uh, from a state and a Commonwealth level in the interests of the residents and their families, because it is important that they get the best possible care. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you. Can the minister confirm whether the government will engage the Royal Commission into Aged Care to undertake a special investigation into what went wrong at Newmarch House? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, the, the Royal Commission has been established with its terms of reference uh, and appropriately uh, has, I think, indicated that they will be looking into the circumstances uh, at uh, at Newmarch, uh, but, but I've asked them, uh, not through a particular um, form of communication but, but by public statements, that I have asked them to look at the circumstances with respect to COVID-19 and its management in all aged care facilities across Australia, because I think it's appropriate. Um, it's not appropriate for me, as Minister, to provide a specific direction to the Royal Commission. They are established through their um, uh, the, the processes that governments put in place. They are free to uh, undertake inquiries as, as they see appropriate. And I understand that the opposition has written to the Royal Commission seeking uh, such a special inquiry, in the, and the Royal Commission, on my understanding, has responded that they will be looking at it, but not in a special sense. Senator Ayres, a final supplementary question. Can the minister provide uh, details to the Senate about the government's engagement with the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety beyond the public statements that he says that he's made um, in relation to investigation into Newmarch House uh, and COVID-19 uh, and, uh, and any other aged care COVID-19 outbreaks? Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr President, and thanks for the question. Uh, it's not appropriate for me to be directly engaging with the Royal Commission. Uh, that's not, a, not an appropriate thing for me to do. Uh, we can, through, uh, through the department, uh, provide uh, information to the Royal Commission on request, uh, but, but I have to respect the Royal Commission, its terms of reference, as they have been established by the governments. That is my responsibility. And so for me to reflect in any way on the Royal Commission would not be appropriate. Uh, uh, it is not an appropriate thing for me to do, uh, and I have taken advice on whether or not I should be engaged directly uh, with the Royal Commission on previous occasions, because there have been some things that I've been uh, that, that I've thought it was appropriate to do. Uh, so, Mr. President, uh, I have, I think, expressed the government's view quite frankly with respect to what we should would like to see in relation to the Royal Commission. The Royal Commission has put out a public statement that it will be investigating the circumstances of COVID-19 in aged care, and I think quite appropriate. Order. Senator, Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed in the notice paper, yeah. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, I have an answer to a question I took on notice uh, yesterday from Senator Lambie in question time regarding the matter of ordinary uh, seaman yeah, Edward Teddy Sheehan. As so poignantly outlined by Senator Lambie yesterday, Ordinary Seaman Sheehan was killed in action on 1 December 1942 
actions that displayed conspicuous gallantry. Sheehan was the subject of a contemporary nomination process, which resulted in the posthumous award of mention in dispatches for his actions in 1942. This award was reviewed by the Defence and uh, Honours and Awards Appeals Tribunal in its 2011 to 2013 Valour Inquiry, which recommended that no action be taken to award ordinary seaman Sheehan a Victoria Cross or other further forms of recognition for his gallantry or valour. The government accepted the recommendations of the Valour Inquiry in, 19, uh, sorry, in, in 2013. The Victoria Cross for Australia is Australia's highest decoration for gallantry and is the only award the Australian Honours and Awards system that is approved by the Sovereign. Clear government policy, informed by Her Majesty the Queen's expressed views, would only allow the award of the Victoria Cross in light of compelling new evidence or in the case of manifest injustice. In, 19, sorry, in 2019, the Tribunal conducted a review of the Valor's inquiry recommendation in relation to the Sheehan Award and subsequently reported to government. Having received confirmation last night in following up from uh, Senator Lambie's question, I am able to advise the Senate today that the government's view that the 2019 review by the Tribunal did not present any compelling new evidence that might support reconsideration of the Valor uh, inquiry's recommendation. That is also my view and that is also the view of defence. It is a very difficult decision, but I believe in the circumstances the right decision. Mr President, oh, Deputy President, Snuck in. I must emphasise that the outcomes of the government decision in no way detracts from the service, the bravery and the sacrifice of ordinary seaman Teddy Sheehan. The Royal Australian Navy rightly continues to commemorate the service of Teddy Sheehan in a number of ways, including through the naming of a Collins-class submarine, HMAS Sheehan. This is a rare form of commemoration in recognition of Teddy Sheehan's exceptional service to our nation and for his ultimate sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Uh, Senator Billick at the lectern. Thank you. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Cormann to the questions asked by Senators Walsh and Sheldon. And the minister's answers show little sympathy for the workers who those opposite have failed to protect throughout this crisis. When the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, announced JobKeeper, the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, said, and I quote, Australians know that their government has their back. Well, many Australians now know that the government doesn't have their back. Instead, this government has abandoned millions of Australian workers with the design of the JobKeeper scheme, throwing them on the scrap heap. The government already rejected Labor's proposal to include casuals who have been employed for less than 12 months. And we've heard that workers like Darcy, mentioned in the question to the minister, have been in their current job for 15 years, yet Darcy is ineligible because he's been with his current employer for less than 12 months. Darcy is just um, one of 1.1 million casuals who have missed out on the JobKeeper because the government refuses to support them. And we heard the minister say that, uh, having a little petty political dig at um, Premier Andrews, that Premier Andrews should just open up hospitality and he should do it now. Well, if that's the case, uh, minister, why can't parliament sit now? Why are we not sitting after tomorrow? There's a good question to ask you. And do you really think the premiers should ignore the health advice they are given by their health officials? I mean, really. Labor has urged the government to improve support for charities to help workers in the arts and to expend, extend the JobKeeper payment to people on temporary visas. And when the scheme was debated in parliament, every one of Labor's amendments was rejected. If the current exclusions aren't bad enough, on the 1st of May, with the stroke of a pen, this government cancelled the JobKeeper scheme for thousands of workers in companies like Donata. 5,500 Donata workers had been assured by their company's management that they would be covered. And now they've been told that the government changed the rules without any warning. The same exclusion that affected Donata workers has also impacted hundreds of workers in hotel chains. 
JobKeeper was put in place to support workers in affected businesses. It was supposed to help them retain their jobs during this uncertain time. Whatever happened to the message that we're all in this together? Because if we're all in this together, let me tell you, the Morrison government has just ignored it. They've just been abandoning millions of workers. Since the federal government shut down of just about all of the aviation uh, operations over the last few months, Donata has had no choice now but to stand down workers. But they did so under the understanding that they could collect JobKeeper payments for those workers. And those workers have been relying on JobKeeper payments. They've been relying on those payments to help with their rent and their mortgages and to buy groceries for their kids and medications for their kids. And I heard Senator Sheldon yesterday speaking about it, and he gave an example of a, a young woman um, whose child you know, they can't afford the medication for that child. And this government just, you know, all put their heads down and ignore that. Not their responsibility. Well, it is their responsibility. For the staff to be told to join Centrelink's queues, knowing that their employment and thousands of their co-workers' jobs are in jeopardy, all because of a nice little loophole the government's dreamt up. So it's been all right for these workers to pay their taxes here, and many of these workers have worked for many, many years—15, 20 years for Donata. They've paid their taxes, but all of a sudden the government says, sorry, we've found this little loophole—one would presume it's to save money for the government—we've found this little loophole, so you're all going to miss out and we don't really care about you. As I said, Donata employs about 5,500 people in Australia, and they're the people you don't actually see at the airport unless you're sitting next to the window uh, of the loading side of the plane, you might see them. They're the people that um, do catering and ground and ramp work. And the staff live right throughout Australia in all different electorates. And in the last six weeks, they have faced devastating uncertainty about their jobs and their industry. They've been stripped of shifts and then stood down. They've been told they would be able to access JobKeeper, then, after this most recent change, told to go and join the Centrelink queues. Many Donata staff have not been paid for extended periods of time because of the conflicting government advice. They have families. They have people who rely on them. They can't pay their mortgages or their rent or their other bills, but, as I said, it's OK for them to have been paying their tax for many, many years. The government has to overturn this unfair decision. JobKeeper was supposed to apply to all workers Thank to you, help Senator keep Billick. them employed. Your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and look, I'd just like to say that these accusations by the Labor Party happen to be quite tawdry by accusing us of saying that we've turned our back on the workers. We have actually doubled, might I add, the job seeker allowance. And should I also add, there's also a number of other uh, allowances on top of that, which will reduce the difference between job seeker and job keeper to a very small amount. Now, except you know, it's not perfect. You know, we had a very limited time frame in which to bring in a financial package that was going to deal with one of the biggest economic and social and health crises this country has faced in a century. And what do we get from the Labor Party? Picking at small issues, at rats and mice. Okay, we have done the, the Greg Hunt in particular has done a fantastic effort with health. We have flattened the curve, and that is in the face of hysteria from many media outlets and all that, saying that we weren't ready, uh, we weren't going to have enough ICU beds, etc., etc. Well, we had more than enough ICU beds. We got the message out there. We got the quarantine measures in at the borders, and we are now in front of many other countries. Uh, and we have actually set an example for many other countries. And hopefully, going forward, we will be able to reopen sooner, and many of these people in casual work will be able to actually get their jobs back and their lives back and their livelihoods back. And can I like to commend the coalition government and Scott Morrison for doing a wonderful job in managing the national cabinet, particularly with all the state premiers, and let's face it, that's like herding cats in this day and age, but he has managed to do it. He hasn't played politics, and we're back here in day one, day two of uh, sitting in parliament here, and you're already, you know, playing politics. I mean, guys, we're not through this yet, OK? I'm sure that some of these issues, and you know, with Donata, I, I take that on board, but you know, it's one of these things. We've also had to balance out the long-term budget with you know, foreign interests and things like that. 
Um, and, and look, Senator Sheldon, happy to work with you later on with some of these issues to make sure that all hardworking Australians are looked after. So I would please ask that we still maintain a spirit of cooperation until we're through this, because we've got to get through the winter months yet. Um, and uh, so anyway, uh, a couple of other things uh, worth pointing out. Uh, I think we've got five and a half million people working um, in the job uh, covered under the job keeper arrangement, and we've actually doubled the job seeker arrangement. And we did that pretty much straight away. Uh, and this is all up going to cost us about $130 billion. And that is a lot of money that we've got to repay in the future. So it's a question of balancing out the long term effects of this with obviously bringing the, uh, flattening the curve and keeping people's heads above water. I'd also like to commend the coalition government for investing heavily in mental health because we have to remember here it's not just the, you know, the health effects of COVID, it's also the health effects of the devastating impacts of the economic downturn. And having worked in finance for a number of years, I, I know what it could be like and what that will do to mental health. So, um, look, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, I think, uh, I should also commend uh, the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, who I think has uh, done a fantastic job in, in working with the various parties and getting these grants out. Uh, so, so, yeah, um, I'm sort of running out of things to say here, but anyway, uh, because, <laughs> Uh, anyway, sorry. Um, uh, look, I'll just clarify some of these uh, issues so people have a better understanding of uh, what we have done. Employees are hired after the 1st of uh, March 2020, and casual employees have been employed for under 12 months as at the first. Uh, uh, hang on, sorry, apologies, wrong with that. Okay, so um, I beg your pardon. Uh, no, no, let's not talk about renewable energy. But actually, I have got on to a separate topic that I will talk about in the last minute, and that is the resentment by Labor of allowing people to access their superannuation. Now, there's not much point putting money away for a rainy day if you're never going to get there. At the end of the day, it's very important to keep meals on the table and the roof over their head. And I think the, the complaining by the Labor Party of letting people access, the workers, access their hard-earned hard funds has been very, very tawdry. At the end of the day, it's about $10 billion, I think they're estimating, out of $3 trillion. It's less than 1 per cent of the total funds under management of superannuation. And can I say it's reflective of the poor cash management practices of some of these super funds that they haven't actually got the liquidity in their bank accounts to meet these payments. But let me say, this is a sign of things to come because superannuation is a massive Ponzi scheme. And when people of my generation get to 60 and they suddenly start withdrawing 40 years of super in one year, you're going to need 40 workers to replace them. Thank right? you, you Senator Rennick. Your time has expired and uh, you did only spend a minute on, but taking note is about the topic, uh, the answers to certain questions and it was on um, uh, JobKeeper, but oh, I was very lenient because, as you said, it was only a minute. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. <coughs> where, where to begin? Uh, well, right now there are millions of uh, casual workers and other Australians who are missing out on the JobKeeper program. Uh, and it just seems like the ministers opposite and some of the senators opposite just don't understand the desperate situation that some of these workers are in. Um, it is a good program. It's a program that the Labor Party and the union movement pushed for, but it needs to be extended to the workers who really need it. Uh, and the Treasurer could fix this with the stroke of a pen, uh, but instead what he's doing is talking about snapping back uh, when so many people are still in crisis uh, and still need support. Uh, and of course, when I asked uh, Senator Cormann uh, today how it's fair to exclude casuals like Darcy Moran, who I spoke to last week, who's been working in hospitality for 15 years, for 15 years with no periods of unemployment, um, but because of the transient nature of hospitality, he's been with his current employer, employer for only a few months. Uh, I think the answer from Senator Cormann was really quite outrageous, uh, and, that it was, and that was that the State Premier, Daniel Andrews, uh, should just reopen hospitality. Darcy should just go back to work right now because the Premier should just reopen hospitality. Uh, no, the government should extend the JobKeeper program to those casuals in hospitality who are excluded. Uh, and it is extraordinary that uh, Senator Cormann 
uh, has called on Daniel Andrews to just reopen the hospitality sector despite the health advice, despite the health advice, despite the risks to the workforce, uh, despite the safety concerns of workers, uh, and despite the risks and the safety concerns uh, in the community. And it seems that this government uh, just doesn't understand the way the labour market works today under the leadership of this government. So many people are in casual and insecure jobs, and that is why so many people are excluded from this JobKeeper program. Uh, in hospitality, 78 per cent of workers are casual, and about half of them, half of them have been with their current employer for less than 12 months. That is the reality of work today under the leadership of this government, and that is why JobKeeper needs to urgently be extended to those casual workers with less than 12 months service, to hard-hit sectors like hospitality and the arts, uh, and many others. Casual workers like Darcy are really struggling. They are struggling to pay the rent. They're struggling to pay bills and to put food on the table. Uh, and for Darcy, that meant that at 30 years of age, he had to actually go home uh, and live with his parents. And moving back in with your parents at the age of 30 after 15 years of continuous work uh, isn't really the dream uh, that any of us have. But it was his only option. Uh, and it was absolutely gut-wrenching for him. And he considers himself to be one of the lucky ones uh, because he knows that some of those who are employed in hospitality won't be able to stay uh, with family and friends, including, of course, those many temporary migrant workers who've also been excluded from the scheme. Uh, and this is a really grim reality that this government is allowing to happen. The government's wage subsidy program is failing some of those who are hardest hit by the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and they could fix it, as we know, with the stroke of a pen. So the question remains, why won't they? Why won't they? There are so many workers out there that need the government to extend JobKeeper to them uh, in their sectors right now, today. And that, of course, includes the Donata workers, uh, more than 5,000 of them, who the government is also choosing to ignore. Uh, and their company is ineligible for JobKeeper, as we know, because the company's parent company um, happens to be a foreign, a foreign government. But these are Australian jobs, Australian workers who are here right now today who are calling on the government for some support. They're calling on the government for assistance. They're calling on the government for backup. They're calling on the government to extend the JobKeeper program to them. The aviation sector has already been hard hit and these workers need government support. As it stands, the JobKeeper program just doesn't account for the actual ownership structure, the, real, the, the reality of the, how the aviation sector works. Um, so we need to send these workers a lifeline. We need to support them and their families. We need them to maintain their connection to their employer. Uh, and like with hospitality, we need aviation in a strong position to recover after the COVID crisis. We need to extend JobKeeper to these sectors now. Thank you, now. Senator Walsh. The time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I stand rise to speak on this uh, important issue of the JobKeeper program. As a senator for Western Australia, I've spent most of my time speaking to as many businesses as I possibly can across the whole state of Western Australia, from the north up in the Kimberley, uh, right the way down to the southwest uh, and into the Great Southern and, of course, in Perth as well. Uh, particularly early on, when we were first discussing the JobKeeper program, before all the details were released, but the, uh, the consideration of the program was put out there in the public, uh, there was, of course, a lot of interest. And, and I really commend the Treasurer in the way that he approached this. Uh, he, he really called upon uh, colleagues to provide feedback so that it could be fed into the design of the program. And, uh, I really commend the Treasurer in the way that he consulted with his colleagues on this to make sure that the program was designed in a way that could pr provide the maximum impact uh, with, and using a system that could be uh, tailored and a system that, that was scalable to, to meet the, the demand that was expected. We expected uh, that there could be up to six million people that would be uh, impacted by this and that would be provided this support. Uh, to date, there's been over five and a half million people that have, uh, have you know, businesses and employees that have, that have been in, uh, impacted and have registered for this. 
and it really is making a solid impact. And I, as I said, I do commend the, the treasurer in, in the design. Uh, and we had to make sure that it was done in a way that it could be rolled out as quickly as possible, using existing systems without having to design new systems that would no doubt be complicated by the fact that you don't have uh, lengthy lead-in time to set these things up. So we've used existing systems to enable this program to happen. So that means that you cannot possibly have it designed to cover every single conceivable person. And this is why we have the safety net of the job seeker program and the doubling of the job seeker payment to ensure that those people that find themselves uh, whether in a situation where they're not eligible for JobKeeper, they have the ability to uh, claim JobSeeker if they are in fact eligible. And we're seeing the impact of the JobKeeper program. Uh, I said I've spoken to lots of businesses across the state. Uh, one particular business is just in the southern suburbs of Perth. Uh, Alba Edible Oils. Now, this is a, a business that produces oils which go into uh, restaurants, uh, and in fact, they ship it across the world. Uh, now, of course, with restaurants closing down due to COVID-19, uh, the, the demand for their product right now is, is not there. Uh, had there not been the JobKeeper program, they would have laid off. They estimate uh, about 17 people in their in their factory. Now, this is an amazing workshop. It's an amazing factory. Uh, what they're able to do is incredible. And the, the time and the energy that they've put into their staff to train them, to equip them to be able to perform uh, in their workplace uh, is very, very considerable. And had they lost that contact with those employees, had they lost that connection with those employees, it would have been very, very difficult for that business to restart and get back up and running. But the JobKeeper program has enabled that business to retain their staff so that when we are through this and when the restaurants reopen, as they're uh, expected to do, many of them as of Monday in Western Australia this coming week, I, and I commend the state government for really leading the way nationally and following the, the guidance from the National Cabinet and, and being part of a, a real leading edge when it comes to the reopening of our economy in Western Australia. Uh, th th this company is, is now set up and ready when things move forward. Uh, they've also, I'm, I'm pleased to see, uh, that this company has received a grant for the Modernising Manufacturing Grant from the Commonwealth. And this is enabling them to purchase new equipment, which is going to streamline <laughs> their operations again. And the, because of the JobKeeper program, they're actually able to implement and put in place the, uh, the, the, the equipment that's necessary uh, for them to grow, for them to develop, the uh, equipment that's going to enable them to uh, uh, for, uh, bring in place new packaging, which will enable them to export to new markets. Uh, this is all possible, and they're able to actually install that equipment because of the JobKeeper program. So that when we're through at the other side of this, they're able to launch ahead. Now, you know, the, the, as I said, the the job seeker payment has been doubled, which means that those that don't have that safety net of the JobKeeper have the safety net and the fallback position of the job seeker program, and those. People will be able to restored, be restored back into employment once we're through thank this process. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. The time has expired. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, Deputy President. Well, isn't this just economically illogical, cruel, inconsistent, and a bloody-minded approach to what we, how to deal with the question that we raised in question time regarding Donata? Let's just cast our minds back about the great double cross by this government, As Senator Rennick quite rightly raised about all of us working together, and we have and will continue. But working together is also making constructive, sensible and logical criticism to steps that the government makes that do, on policies that do not make sense, do not make economic sense, and certainly are inconsistent. What's clear in this particular double-cross is there was a clear understanding when this proposal was put forward regarding JobKeeper that the number of people that would be included in JobKeeper is fallen now one million short. There was an understanding to the Australian public who was going to be covered. Donata workers, JobKeeper going to many millions of workers, but one million short. There is a capacity, there is an ability, and there was an undertaking about these workers properly being covered. Now, I don't call those people rats and mice. I don't think Senator Reddick was talking about the individuals. 
He's talking about the cases and examples that we're bringing up. This case is not a rats and mice case. It's five and a half thousand Australian families. And to be specific, it's families right across this country. A thousand and sixty-one to be specific in New South Wales, mums and dads raising their families who have been left out because the government decided to change its policy and double-cross those workers. It's 1,124 to be specific families, mums, dads, people raising their kids, wondering what's going to happen tomorrow. Well, they've been double-crossed. 1,120 in Queensland, double-crossed. 196 in South Australia, also double-crossed. Northern Territory, eight and the ACT 18. They've all been double-crossed by this government. They said one thing and they did another. They shortchanged just a million people in this country not getting support because there was a deal done and an understanding done about what this would do to the Australian public. This was about not only getting safety back to our Australian community and giving them support to connect them to businesses, but to stimulate the economy. Now, I'll just go to two examples. If you don't believe me, there's two examples. J.P. Morgan, very well respected Miss Hall from there, said that, along with Miss Wood from the former OEC director, both believe that higher levels of public spending will be needed to fire up the economy, the recovery. Miss Wood went further to say so that things like cash payments, we know that these have been helpful through the crisis in getting people out and spending. We, are, we have to make sure that we're spending the amount of money that you said we all agreed, the community agreed, as part of a compact that you've now double-crossed by leaving a million people short in this country and 5,500 Donata workers. So let's talk about these people and the rats and mice issues that we're raising. Donna Pearce. Donna's married with two children, 21 and 17. She lives in Ro 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 Romsey in the Macedon, uh, Ranges, Macedon Ranges in Victoria and has worked at what is now Donata's Melbourne Airport site since the 2000 Sydney Olympics. Now, Donata, putting this in context, Donata is a company that, was pur that purchased Qantas, an Australian catering company, who per and they, Donata purchased another Australian company to make its catering business. These are Australian taxpayers. Not one cent goes in subsidy to uh, Donata, as, no, as one cent should not be going into subsidy to any company, including Qantas, I might add, who have been used their subsidies for annual leave and people's leave entitlements, even sick leave. But Ms Pearce, this is her circumstances and what she had to say. More important than Senator Broderick, than Minister Cormann or myself. She said, I don't understand what the government's problem is, but they don't have an explanation for why they are excluding them. Excluding them. Do they expect the Dubai government to fork out for Australian workers who work in Australia and pay the Australian government taxes? Donna has a mortgage Order. with a husband. Senator Sheldon, time for contributions expired. The question is the motion moved by Senator Billick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. Response to my question to Senator Cormann, uh, Mr. President. Um, Senator Cormann told the Senate today that the government's number one responsibility now is to is to protect Australian citizens, and I would argue that's exactly what the Bank's Royal Commission was set up to do, with its 76 recommendations, recommendations that went to reform, to protect small business, to protect Australian farmers, to protect first Australians, to protect lenders, households, mums and dads, consumers of financial advice. One of the biggest reforms in the financial services sector and financial economy that we've seen in this country. 76 recommendations. And so extraordinary were the revelations from this Royal Commission and so shocked were the Australian public many media commentators and parliamentarians in this place, that we saw something extraordinary happen. 
We saw something extraordinary happen the day that Commissioner Hayne handed down his recommendations. The Liberal Party, the LNP, said they would legislate those recommendations in full before they were even released. And the Labor Party pledged the same thing, as did the Greens and other crossbenchers. What other Royal Commission have we ever seen that happen on? 76 recommendations. Well, they were passed down in February last year in the 45th parliament. We are now in the 46th parliament, 15 months later, and no legislation, no reform has happened in this country following Commissioner Haynes' recommendations. We know we are going into a deep recession in this country. We know it's going to be difficult times ahead. I would have thought that if Senator Cormann wanted to protect Australians, he would legislate these recommendations. Think about this. They were due to be legislated, at least half of the recommendations by Commissioner Hayne were due to be legislated by June this year. That's next month. I presume that Treasury has been working around the clock to get this legislation ready. Indeed, that's exactly what they've told us at Estimates. The reason this critical financial reform, so important to protect Australians, has been delayed is because the big end of town, the big banks, the big financial services companies, the big insurance companies have lobbied this government to delay this reform. If it was true that because of COVID it was impossible for the banks to be able to do this, even though they've had 15 months, including significant consultation with Treasury to this point, if it was true, we could still legislate that, that recommendations and this reform, but put effective starting dates six or 12 months down the track. Why don't we lock it in? So many of us are calling for parliament to resume. The Greens will be putting up a motion to do exactly this in June. We can use this opportunity to legislate this reform when it was due to be legislated. And if industry crying, kicking and screaming, then fine. Let's make it effective in six months' time, but let's get it done. Who knows, Mr President, when this government's going to go to the next election? Some are speculating it may be as early as August next year. If we are then delaying the bulk of the Royal Commission recommendations and legislation to June next year, which is what the Treasurer said, I would argue that's one parliamentary sitting away from a potential election. Will we even see it in this parliament? It was an election promise by the Liberal Party that they would legislate these recommendations in full. There is no reason that we should be letting big corporations dictate our legislative agenda in the highest chamber in this country. There is no reason at all, except they've clearly got to this government. This was non-controversial. It had unanimous support from all political parties in this place. We could get this legislation done in June if we recall parliament and do our job. That's what the Greens want to see. That's what the Australian public want to see. We promised them that after a $60 million Royal Commission and the shocking revelations and the significant reform that was outlined, that we would do that. We would do that in this parliament. And I urge senators to listen to the Greens, recall parliament, get the Order, job done. Senator Wish Wilson. The question is the motion moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it.